Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Today, our CEO, Diana Verdeneto, will be in conversation with the author, sustainability talk leader, and founder of Volant, John Elkington, Margaret Enriquez, president and CEO of the House of Krug, and Dini Hall, founder and creative director of the eponymous jewelry brand, Dini Hall. In this webinar, they will be discussing uh, the power of resilience, sorry, and how to emerge uh, stronger on the other side of uh, challenges. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box uh, and we will take 15 minutes at the end to answer uh, all your questions. Over to you, Diana. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you so much, uh, Maggie, John and Dini for joining us today on to uh, discussing the power of resilience. And what a topic, right? I mean, resilience is something that we all have been uh, trying to find more and uh, keep on top of it because obviously um, this time has not been easy for anyone but even in our day-to-day -day life resilience is incredibly important and and i'd like to start by actually asking what does resilience means to you and let's start with you john and then i love to hear maggie and in your opinion on on this so yes what does resilience means to you well i, I to me it it, it's a, a number of things. So, for example, I think pe some people are just born resilience. They're like those little yellow ducks that you have in the bath. You push them down and they bounce back. Other people sort of develop resilience. You know, my parents went through the Second World War, would often say that that was their happiest time, even though they were losing people all around. And, you know, they had a resilience, which I think many people in my generation don't quite have. Um, but then that's the individual level. And we've got to think about family resilience, community resilience, organizational resilience, national and economic uh, resilience, and then at the global level, <clears throat> the biosphere. Uh, and it, it's suddenly this COVID-19 pandemic has put everything into almost an X-ray. And we can see all of the defects and the weaknesses and the fault lines. And we're going to have to spend a lot of time on resilience now, I think. Maggie, what about you? What does resilience mean to you? I mean, you are one of the few presidents of, uh, you know, kind of female presidents or, or one of the oldest champagne houses in the world. You are Venezuelan, uh, which that comes with incredible amount of, uh, as a Latin American, I completely have incredible empathy for you. So um, what does re resilience mean to you? Yeah. Well, for me, means really the capacity of understanding tough moments, difficulties, traumas as ways of getting stronger and better. At the end, it's about that. It's about dealing with difficult times, moments, or crisis, or, uh, very uh, difficult moments or, or, or accidents and uh, deal with them in a way that you accept, but you transform these into ways that you will end stronger and better. And this is why I like very much the art of Kintsuji in Japan that uses, you know, the, they put the pots together with gold. And uh, this is a very, very beautiful metaphor for resilience. Thank you very much. Um, Dini, um, one of the most iconic jewelry designers, British, you have gone through everything for the last, I don't know how many years you have to your business. 35 now. Uh, exactly. So what does resilience mean to you? Well, I think it's something, I agree with John, that some people are, are, are born with it. Um, and perhaps that tends to be more uh, creative people or entrepreneurial people who have that resilience and it enables them to uh, be brave and go out there and take the knockbacks. But I kind of see resilience like um, uh, building blocks. And if you, if you look at um, building up resilience throughout your life and in, and in business, in whatever you do, um, you know, it's, it, it's a way of sort of visualizing how you can build up a wall of resilience and not not get knocked down every time there's something that uh, is put in front of you, like a recession or um, 
or loss or um, something like the COVID-19 pandemic, which I think we all, when, when, when um, in the first few days of realizing what lockdown meant, all over Europe, I think everyone was very fearful. And, and I think that that fear and anxiety can really get in the way of resilience. And you have to be able to somehow take those blocks and, and build a kind of way to, uh, to, to stay, stay strong and see your way through um, anxiety, which is, which is one of the things that is most disruptive, I think, in, in life for people. Thank you very much. I mean, that's really insightful. Um, I mean, Maggie, uh, can you tell us a time in which you have to be resilient or you had to be resilient? Um, and how did you do it? Well, many times, <laughs> many times, because, you know, as a good Latin American, I became expert in crisis. So I have gone through crisis all the time, leading companies in 92, when I went to Mexico, it was 95, the company was losing $20 million per year, and it was the tequila crisis, and we just completely transformed the company, reinvented the company, and put it in, in black in, in 18 months. Never, never fired anyone in, in recession. I arrived in Argentina in 2001, crisis exploded, never fired anyone, reinvented the company, and it was absolutely great. And I arrived in, in Krug, and it was also the suffering of 2008 and 9 and an internal problem. And, and, uh, and I failed the first year. And, uh, and then I, I realized what I had to do. So I think uh, resilience is very connected to attitude and to spirituality. And so I have gone through my life uh, many, many times because, well, because of being Latin American, because life put me in front. I think it's very connected to that, and uh, and it's uh, it's something we can work, we can work. Thank you, and yes, of course. I mean, Argentina, Venezuela, Latin America, crisis is the norm, isn't it? I mean, when we are not in crisis, we don't really know what to do. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this, no. This, this is normal. <laughs> no, it's terrible. Um, yeah. Tini, what what about you? Well. I think that, you know, you can go through, well, I, what, one of the times that I had to draw most on my inner resilience um, was when um, my company nearly folded. I mean, I think every designer has been through um, periods of time where they question whether they can get through the next week financially. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I had to draw on, on I, I'm not a Buddhist, but I had to draw on kind of Buddhist um thought and um sort of ideology well no it's not an ideology i had to draw on buddhist teaching to um to kind of let the the fear go right the way through through me and 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 in, enable to be able to face the day without the the, the fear and and so i think that it, it's a little bit like um uh, the the Japanese, what was the Japanese um, art Kintsugi. form of the ceramics that you were talking about? Kintsugi. Kintsugi. Yes, yes it's, it's, it's a truly beautiful thing to do, to, yes, to, to, to mend something that's broken, something so beautiful, but you can make beauty out of something that's broken. And I love that analogy, I really do. I really do. But I think, I think you have to be able to, to um, have a slightly meditative, state of mind to do that as mm. well as you know um to get to very difficult times i think yeah to be able to try and meditate and that doesn't mean to say you have to sit cross-legged in prayer it can be it can be <laughs> it can be um walking in in the woods and just being with nature or uh, there are many 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 different ways that you can you can sort of blot blot out the outside white noise and um and and find resilience thank you yeah i mean it's um it's interesting it's just like you need to find stillness in your mind to I think so. it's hard isn't it in cities yeah yeah very hard and but, and on lockdown <laughs> when yeah, you're that, everything's virtual it's still it's hard <laughs> true 
John, what about you? I mean, you have gone through, again, uh, you know, from a sustainability perspective, you started this movement or you, you were part of this movement for about, I don't want to be disrespectful, but what, 30 something years? That's disrespectful because it's <laughs> much longer than that, Diana. I'm oh, sure you're right, trying to take it. Um, I started off in the late 60s, early 70s. I founded or co founded uh, four social businesses, all for profit ones since 1978. They all still exist, and that will tell you given what's happened over that period. I can't rival Maggie's uh, uh, South American uh, experiences, but I was brought up in Northern Ireland, I was brought up in Cyprus, I was brought up in Israel, all of them at the time in, in uh, conflict situations of one sort or another. But all of those businesses I've helped um, co-found have gone through periods of excruciating pain where it's been touch and go as to whether they would uh, continue and if I've learned anything from all of that apart from surround yourself with people who are not in this just simply because it's a it's it's for a paycheck or, or status or whatever it is but because they believe in something that is um, in a way a higher purpose and I think it's much easier to be blown off course if you don't have that sense of true north or higher purpose and I think it's it's easier to be resilient if you and I, you know, I'm not religious. In fact, I'm, if anything, I'm, I'm sort of uh, deeply atheistic. But I, I, I do think that you need that sense of something bigger than you, something that goes on after you. And for me, in many ways, the sustainability agenda over the years and that sense of intergenerational responsibility has been absolutely central to sort of giving me a, a degree of resilience. Final point, I, I think the point where I was most frightened was in the late 80s, where my then organization, Sustainability, was sued over five months by McDonald's. We, we won that case in the end, but you know, it basically could have destroyed us at the time, so. Thank you. And um, can you learn resilience, or is it something that you're born with? I mean, Maggie, I'd like to take, uh, I'd like to ask you this first to you. No, I think you can learn. And I think you can build <clears throat> education programs in, in, in schools and since kids are uh, young, uh, they can learn in the, the way education is, is, um, is given. Uh, families, you can teach your, your kids uh, to, to be resilient. And, but I think it's not just that. Resilience is a combination. And I said before, and you mentioned John, this kind of, I, use, I say spirituality, which is nothing to do with religion, is just this inside very solid values and attitude, you see? Knowledge adds, experience adds, and attitude multiplies, you see? And so the combination of these values, strengths, this inside, this, this kind of sense, and that you understand that you have a responsibility and you have a responsibility as a human being and you want to go further because life is not finished. And, and so the way you teach your, your children, the way uh, they, they grow up and then they will have the resources. The resilience is a kind of a resource. And so you have the resource to go through tough moments and then at the end, you feel stronger. Why? Because you understand a difficult moment, a crisis, Nothing comes by chance. It is the end of something, the beginning of a new era. And it's for every one of us to go through and to build a new stage. So I think you can, you can, you can learn this. You can learn by getting stronger in, in spiritually. You can get, learn by, by trying to get clear with your values because they are so important at the moment you go through tough times. And uh, you, you, can, you can get stronger uh, and, 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 and more resilient by, by working and be aware of how to improve your attitude, you see? So I think you can learn. Thank you. Um, John, what, what are your thoughts on this? Can you learn it? I think you can learn it. I think, as I said earlier on, some people are just born with a more resilient uh, character. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree with what's been uh, said, except I think a lot of what I've heard so far is 
let absorb what the stress is that life throws at you and you come back stronger and the implication is that um it's it's not it's not talking about passivity but i look at gandhi for example as somebody who absorbed the stress that was thrown at him and at his movement and kept coming back uh, stronger but at certain points in all of this this does become uh, a stand and fight set of issues so for example one of the biggest drains on my life has been i came into this in the actually uh, as a child in the 50s really interested in wildlife really interested particularly in northern ireland in eels so we were talking a moment ago about wetlands and so on but over my lifetime and over certainly in my working life the population of european eels has gone down 99 percent the united states is 95 percent in asia it's over 90 percent again and and so the whole time you're getting this information and evidence about the climate or whatever it is. I wrote my first uh, report on climate change in 1978. And ever since that moment, things have consistently got worse. Um, and so you, you have to absorb that. But at some point, you have to ask yourself the question, am I part of the problem? By being passive, by being sort of helpful and supportive to people trying to do good work, am I simply allowing the system to get away with crashing the biosphere or whatever and i'm getting to the point where i i i want to be friendly uh, but i equally feel that part of uh, ensuring longer term resilience for all generations of all all species is going to mean that we have to stand up and really agitate uh, for change first of all. i agree thank you um and this actually begs for a question in terms of like, I, I like to ask you, Dini, and like, what kind of changes in leadership can we expect um, in order to uh, thrive in these challenging times? Do we, do we have to change? Well, I think, I think we need a more um, empathetic leadership. I mean, you look at some of the, the, the leaders we have in, in, on, on, in banks and on Wall Street, and I, I certainly don't say them all, but there's a, a good splattering of psychopaths out there as leaders. And I don't think that's an awfully good idea, really, but there are too many. So I think we need to, um, to choose our, our leaders more carefully. Or maybe that depends on who we follow, though, because you don't choose someone to start off a business that that's the, the entrepreneur's choice but um i think we have to be careful who we work for i think and and a, a good a good ceo a good leader um i think would, would does teach resilience because i think it's very very natural for um people when when they're just learning how to um uh, be in the workplace and learning their roles um, to be rather anxious and and, and I think that an anxiety is the enemy of resilience so um, you I think you, you need you, one has to teach um, people to not be anxious but our society fans anxiety particularly in America and I don't you know uh, we, we, we tend to be dissing America rather a lot but I think the fact that you can fall over and sue and sue um, and, and sue the person whose door set it, it is that you've fallen over on, and, you know, that's that's all based on 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 um, anxiety and fear and and um, and resilience. You don't build resilience in that um, by being fearful. Thank you. I mean, Maggie, in terms of leadership, do you think that we need to have uh, a different kind of toolkit for what is coming is coming our way post covid um, what do you know i think you have trends that were there that are going to accelerate you know that what you look for in in leadership and this more and more uh, emotional intelligence and this uh, this um, capacity of networking uh, this completely off authoritarian system bringing together talent and, uh, and, and really sharing the objective, listening, listening, and, and build together a project that, that is embraced by people as their own project. This is a trend and was a trend already, and this is just going to accelerate uh, because, because you need action. And I completely agree with John. 
uh, and I believe resilience is accompanied by action. You have to move, you have to see, there is a vision, you see over the wall on the situation and you, you just take people with you and I can tell you, I can say that I've done it. And in the case of crew, which I think interesting, and you talk about Kintsugi, this, this art of breaking the pieces with gold and creating a piece that is more beautiful. You know, I failed my first year when I arrived in, in Krug, and I failed because I, I underestimated the problem, and I failed. And, uh, and then I realized, and I just corrected the way, and it's been a great project. But every time I can, and I talk to younger generations, I just explain to them how I failed. And I was 53 years old, and I was 31 years of experience, and I failed. And it's important people know they can fail and they just have to learn to stand up again and go over and, and go on. And, um, and I think we can, a leader today has to be humble, of course, has to accept mistakes, has to show that we are human and vulnerable. And then you build networking and with a good networking, you really get the creative solutions to go over and be stronger. And you make stronger your whole organization. Thank you. I mean, John, what is your experience in terms of, I mean, you've been talking to, we had a call yesterday, we, we discussed uh, the work that you're doing with uh, Green Swan and you have talked to so many people now being co coalition. So what is your vision for leadership after COVID? Well, we have just done this uh, study for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, looking at two things. One is um, 10 years ago, WBCSD pulled together a Vision 2050 uh, mapping of saying, you know, over the next uh, 40 years, what's going to happen? How's that going to affect business? What does business leadership look like? And now we've, we've been part of that refresh that's just published. But at the same time, we also did a study looking at COVID-19 and what the implications for business and markets are likely uh, to be. And one of the things that constantly strikes me, and this is about resilience, is that many people nowadays are almost ahistorical. They, they, they have not studied history in any great depth. The media do not uh, properly feed us with anything but a, a, a fragmented view of what uh, history has taught us or should have taught us as a species. It happens to have been my most, uh, my favorite subject when I was at school. And I think one of the things that we're being forced now in very short order to learn about again is pandemics. I mean, the Spanish flu and uh, polio. When I was at school, uh, people suffered from polio. They were, you know, a couple of them were in iron lungs, but all of that just goes out of the collective memory. And with yeah. that, loss of memory, you get a sense of entitlement. You know what reality is meant to be. You feel entitled to have more of what you've already got. And then suddenly, out of the blue, uh, you know, a different reality starts to surface. And that's where I think we are now. A final uh, reflection is those business leaders that I have most enjoyed working with and who I think have the best potential to deliver uh, uh, progress in complicated times have a deep sense not of everything that moved in history but that sense of to some degree this doesn't all go in a, st a straight line there are waves and there are cycles uh, and we've got to be prepared for some of those sorts of things so that would be what one perspective thank you and um before we go to the q and a's um i'd like to ask kind of my last question for for you three, which is, what are the tips? How can, what are the wise words that you will leave us with that we can start practicing um, resilience? And I'd like to start with you, uh, Dini, if I may. Well, I think um, be prepared to look at your plans, um, your strategies, your ideas, your, what you want to create, and be prepared to scrap it and throw it into the bin, <laughs> if need be, and start again. Because actually very often, you know, if you've got to write an essay or, or, or if you're forced to design something very quickly, you know you could do better. And so 
that would be what I would suggest is just don't be fearful to to change and um, because you might go down a better uh, road. Thank Basically. you. Thank you very much. And uh, Maggie? I think, um, you know, we, it, this will start by awareness. Mm. This means the capacity of observing yourself. And so the tip is, uh, you're part of the problem, you're part of the solution. You know, when jo John was saying, if we think the problem of sustainable development is outside us, we are just bad. We are all part of the problem. And so, and then in this capacity of observing yourself, you're part of the problem, you're part of the solution. What is what you're doing to add to the solution? You observe yourself. And then your attitude. Your attitude in front of the difficulties. Okay, this situation is being very, very tough and it's bringing us a lot of problems. What are you doing in front of this problem? What is what your, your, your answer is? And so if people keep this awareness high and observe yourself and be exigent in what is what you're doing? What is your attitude you know, in front of these difficulties? You're part of this. What is your solution? Or you're waiting for somebody to bring the solution. And, and if you then uh, you are aware and you then ask yourself to do and change, uh, I think uh, you'll be more resilient. And you will find that that is a much better way to deal with difficulties than to be passive and not doing anything and be all the time uh, a victim. And then, and then when you are a victim, the world drives you. You don't drive anything. Yeah. See? No, absolutely. I would say that as a, like a tip. Thank you. John? Well, just to build on, on, on what Maggie's said and what Denny said before, um, I think the critical component now is to lean into the future, not to be frightened, not to be defensive, to accept that the future is going to be radically different and to understand that means that it can't all come from our brain uh, because we all in different ways have been taught in different ways, we've had different experiences, we've uh, reached all sorts of conclusions along the way and our assumptions are in the process of being challenged in a very, very profound way. So I think one of the things I would recommend to anyone of any age that I talked with is to firstly embrace the future and Diana, you very kindly came to my 70th, 70th birthday party last uh, June. And one of the things I said there, you know, I'm, I'm 70, many people of my age are retiring I feel the next 10 to 15 years are going to be the most exciting, the most challenging, and in some degree, uh, the most dangerous of my entire working life. But now we have to leave, lean in and we have to engage with people we've never heard of, and including people we really may not like terribly or agree with uh, very much. But now's the time to forge very different alliances and connections. And hopefully, you know, webinars like this uh, are, are one element of that. And I do hope you're about to go into Q&A, but I do hope you will share the questions that we don't get to answering with the panelists afterwards. I always find those fascinating, but back to you. Thank you very much. Your birthday party was really inspiring because this is a man that is about to turn 70, which I have a huge crush crash on. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there he is saying, thank you for very much for coming and connecting an incredible amount of incredibly accomplished people and say by the way this is your problem now um so i will help you to be part of the solution and we ran out of time so come on let's do it and let's go faster so incredibly inspirational um and i'm sorry again to subestimate how many years i will i will not discuss that anymore i shut up now better <laughs> uh okay i'll go to the q a um i understand the resilience is key business tool but how do you know when it's, uh, it's also time to give up because energy is better expend elsewhere? Um, I don't know who would like to take that. Well, I could because I've wanted to give up so many times. <laughs> um, and I think, I think you really do know when you, you should know. You should be able to know when you've got your back against the wall. It's when you can't see any road out. And then to lay down your tools and 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 accept that something hasn't worked it's an honorable thing to do there's no shame in that 
and uh, you know you learn from those experiences so sometimes you just have to 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 give in Thank you. And this is a question for Maggie. Um, Susana Cardenas, which I believe is Latin American, maybe. Uh, a question, uh, so she says, does your Latin American background, a continent that faces a crisis on a daily basis, have made you more resilient? Is your nationality an advantage during these uh, challenging times? Well, <clears throat> for sure, the, 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 what John said at the beginning, the, the life puts you in circumstances uh, that will, will force you to be more resilient. But if I go to the real origin, I have always loved to help people. I've always loved to give. As a matter of fact, I started to work because I love to give and I couldn't give the, with the money of my husband. So I worked, I started to work because I want to give. And so when you want to give and you want to give to others, uh, you just are in front of any difficult situation and you will just find the ways to transform them to assure um, continuity for these people. So I think, uh, yes, the Latin American condition, and I always I mean, I make a joke about it because I say you, you become a crisis expert, it has made us uh, resilient. But I think, and I come back to these values and spirituality, Honestly, it is more driven by my internal love for people and to help people than by the fact that I am Latin American. Thank you. And this is a question for John. Um, when you start your career and talking about sustainable development, sustainability, probably you were pretty much alone. How did you keep motivating and resilient to all the pushbacks that you probably have encountered? Um, I, <laughs> uh, I remember when we set up sustainability, for example, in 1987, I, for about two years afterwards or three years, I really thought I'd picked the wrong name for the organization because we still used to get physical mail then, I mean, post, and everyone misspelled the term. It was survivability, sustainability, you name it, not, not the word because people just hadn't heard, it, heard of it. But now people uh, talk about that very... Um, uh, easily and in some ways glibly. But the answer is, I was born, I, you know, I, I can be pessimistic. I am in some ways a depressive, but I was actually born with a degree of optimism. I actually genuinely think that if we put our minds to it over a long enough period, we can change almost anything, uh, any of the challenges that we um, uh, face. And I've always had the great privilege of working on themes that absolutely fascinate me, absolutely engage me, uh, fundamentally, existentially, in some ways. I mean, going back to what Maggie said, you've really got to, uh, you know, if, if, if you've got that internal desire to help, whether it's people or, or other species or whatever it is, that's a huge factor in developing resilience. The other thing, I'm just very privileged. I, my, my wife and I have been now together for 52 years, and family, it goes through all sorts of different uh, phases, but um, immensely uh, important. And F networks of friends and as we've seen with the COVID-19 lockdown suddenly we're redis rediscovering community and that's yeah. immensely exciting so I keep finding new reasons to be uh, engaged. Thank you um, and this is from Antonia it's a, it's a question for Maggie um, she's only 22 years old and uh, she's doing her bachelor degree and, you start, and she asked, is there anything that you would recommend to become more aware of yourself and to finally become more resilient? Yeah, <clears throat> yes. You know, it says exercises, you come at the end of, you start by, at the end of the day, <clears throat> you see all you did during the day. You observe, because it, the awareness is to be observing yourself. So there is a good exercise that uh, I had put in practice many years ago. So you, you, at the end of the day, you, like you do a balance of the day, what you've done, and you, you observe what you've done. And you may go and correct the next day. Much better is that every time you're going to say something, every time you're going to do something, you are, everything is before going in action, is in your mind. So you give yourself 30 seconds to see what you're going to do. You observe yourself. You simulate what you're going to do, and you're going to say. And you will be aware of your actions. This will help you to observe yourself more. 
And then while you observe yourself, you can help yourself by saying, this is not the right attitude, this is a negative attitude, and then you try, can try to correct yourself. All of these will help you to get more resilient because you will observe yourself and you will criti be critical of yourself. You know, I always love this, uh, one, once Bernard Arnault was giving a kind of a session in, in, uh, in 2016 and he said, well, I played tennis and suddenly I was in front of uh, Federer and I felt so good. And I really want to share with you this feeling because I love this feeling. And, uh, and why I love this feeling? Because I was in front of excellence. And in front of excellence, you have nothing else to do but question yourself. And I think this, if you combine both, you know, you always have, you put excellence in front of you. And at the same time, you observe yourself and give you these 30 seconds before acting or saying, or you start by doing this at the end of the day, you will see that this will be coming little by little. That is incredibly helpful and insightful. Thank you very much, Maggie. And this is a question for the panel, and um, perhaps then you could answer this. Uh, Lucian says, great feedback, thank you. I'm driving a lot of sustainab sustainable changes in our hotel company. This change is progressing much faster due to COVID. Uh, there is a lot of resistance from the team, and we are struggling to get all, uh, all on board, despite, despite dis discussing their fears. How do you suggest we deal with the people that persistently resist change? It's a very difficult one. And I think probably many, many, many companies, large and small, have to deal with this. Um, I've, I've had to come up with a, what I've called as a new manifesto, post-COVID manifesto for my own business. And, um, and within it, I've tried to individualize each member of staff so that within the manifesto itself they can see their part and and then um there's an end product i mean there's of course never an end business but there's there's um there's a goal that we that we want to achieve and obviously like um a hotel the hotel industry has been devastated by this and so has my business in many ways because I have um, six retail stores and we've, we, we've had them closed for, for months. And um, so there's going to be a negativity anyway because people just don't know what to do when their livelihoods have been just completely changed. But I think, I think building a kind of uh, a Bible, a brand Bible for your specific hotel and then including every every member of staff and kind of writing little little roles for them it doesn't have to be much a short paragraph um can help people actually see themselves in in the future and that i mean it's baby steps but i found that 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 really helps bring people together when they when they can see a, a document and see themselves in it and their part that they may be able to play thank you and this is a question for the panel i, I would be very interested and I'm sure that everybody else listening to this will be also interested in your take, Maggie and John. John, go ahead. I was, I was waiting for you, Maggie. Um, <laughs> let, me just, let me just, okay, I'll, I'll take the baton. Um, when I think about hotels, I, I think about very complex supply chains very often. A lot of these hotels are artisanal and, and, and low scale, obviously, but uh, I, I think you have to have conversations and those have to be sustained over time and it's with employees and it's with suppliers and it's with the local community but critically it's with your customers and when I think about the sustainable development space I, I'm luckily uh, one of my friends is called Hervé Houdre and I first met him when he was running the Willard Hotel in Washington DC and then went, went on to run into Continental Hel a Hotel in, in New York and he had this magical ability to engage his customers where they happened to be. With me, it was history. He took me to a nearby bookshop. I bought a couple of um, biographies of American presidents, but it came out of a discussion of sustainability. And for him, wherever the customer was, he would take it somehow back to sustainability, not being a preacher, not stuffing it down their throats, 
but just gently and in an informative way as part of you know, emergent friendship, uh, engaging with people in, 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 in a really powerful uh, set of conversations. So I, I, I think don't underestimate your ability to have those conversations. And even though sometimes you're only changing the world one person at a time, that can be immensely powerful if it, if it can be made to work. Thank you. Maggie, I think uh, you have the uh, last word because we are also coming to, to time. So over to you. So talking about change, I couldn't agree more what John said. I think there are two things which are very important. Normally crises help uh, changes. People are more open to change. But I always remember, and it's been, I have used it all my life, uh, through my life, is Anthony Robbins used to say in the 80s, he wrote this, and he used to say, you know, people are not going to be ready to change <clears throat> if they don't have a deep and good understanding of what will happen if they do not change. So my father lost 25 kilos, not because he was going to look nicer and more beautiful, but because the doctor said, if you don't lose weight, you're going to die. And it was true. And so he lost the 25 kilos. So I think it's about this conversation based on understanding the other and trying then to bring the, the, what will happen if we do not change and make it being embraced by the other. Because you are understanding others, people's fears and you deal with it. But for me, people do not change if they do not understand what comes after not having change. Well, I mean, thank you very much. I feel incredibly lucky to have known you all. Well, actually Maggie and, and John for a long time and, and Dini uh, is a new butterfly mark uh, brand. So it's short but sweet. Um, and you inspire me every day. Uh, and I learn so much every day. I mean, John, when I started my career, I used to sign up to your office uh, after running or whatever. And you used to kind of put me back together when I started my first company. Maggie, you have given Positive Luxury uh, your belief. And Group was, well, the first champagne brand that has been awarded the Butterfly Mark. And so I'm very honored to really share uh, you with everybody else uh, watching today. And Dini, thank you so much for being part of our community and to doing all the work that you're doing on sustainability as well. So uh, without further ado, I would like to thank you again and pass it on to Claudia. So thank you so much for, for today. Next Thursday at 2 p.m. we'll be hosting the 10th episode of the Power Series and we'll be discussing the power of positive attitude with three special guests. Don't forget to sign up to our newsletter today uh, to receive your special invitation and stay safe. Thank you all again. Um, see you soon. Thank Bye. you very much, Thanks, everybody. Claudia. Take Bye. care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.